Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the newly released What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide on Preparing Young Children for School. This is the first of three webinars on this practice guide. This webinar will focus on the first two practice guide recommendations on social emotional learning and executive function. This webinar is being recorded. A link to view the recorded webinar will be shared via email to all attendees who registered for this webinar. The full practice guide and supporting materials, including this recording, will be also available on the IES website. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the expert panelists and do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of the WWC. Resources shared during this webinar are not necessarily WWC products, nor developed from IES funded work. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them in the Q&A box and we will address them towards the end of the webinar. Practice guides are products developed by the What Works Clearinghouse or WWC. Practice guides provide educators with evidence-based practices to tackle current challenges in education. They combine the best available evidence and expertise on a topic to give educators strategies to use in their classrooms and schools. This practice guide on preparing young children for school is intended for educators in preschool classrooms, those supervising teachers or overseeing educational practices for preschool programs, program directors and coordinators, district and state personnel, and parents and caregivers seeking to help children. This slide lists the 11 panel members who collaborated to develop this practice guide. Our presenters today include our panel chair, Peg Birchinell from the University of Virginia, Karen Bierman from Penn State University, Megan McClellan from Oregon State University, and Kimberly Nelson from Rockford Public Schools. We'll start this webinar with a brief overview of the evidence levels for the two recommendations, followed by an introduction to the overarching themes in the practice guide. Then our presenters will discuss recommendation one on social emotional learning and recommendation two on executive function, including the corresponding how-to steps. Each recommendation is assigned a level of evidence that indicates the strength of the evidence for the effect of the recommended practices on student achievement. The level of evidence is based on the number of studies supporting the recommended practices, whether the recommended practices were directly tested in the studies or tested in combination with other practices, whether the recommended practices consistently led to improved outcomes within and across studies, and whether the studies capture a diverse range of students and contexts. Recommendation one has a strong level of evidence and recommendation two has a moderate level of evidence. I will now pass it on to Peg Birchinell, the panel chair. Peg? Thank you, I'm Peg Birchinell. Um, I'm from the University of Virginia. And before I talk about the overarching themes, I would like to thank IES for recognizing the need for an evidence-based practice guide for preschool and for making it happen. I'd like to thank IRG for graciously and effectively shepherding the process. And I'd like to thank all of the panelists for, for sharing their expertise. Um, as we talked about evidence-based practices that support learning in social, social emotional development, executive functioning, mathematics, literacy, and language. There were certain themes that involved practices that were fundamental to learning skills in all of these areas. The first practice involved the importance of scheduling time for intentional learning. Children learn best when instruction is intentional. This involves developing lesson plans that articulate the what, how, and where lessons are conducted. In terms of the what and how, it's important to pace in the presentation of lessons from easy to more difficult. It's also important to be deliberate, plan how you will present each new skill and perhaps invent questions or activities to not only keep the children engaged, but also to check whether children are understanding what you're teaching. Um, it's also important to ensure that children have lots of active opportunities to practice the new skills. This is probably when learning actually occurs. In terms of where, we recommend a, we, we recommend a combination of settings. We recommend whole group and small group instruction to introduce new skills, ideally limiting whole group 
to 10 minutes at a time. We recommend center and individual activities to give children hands-on opportunities to practice. And again, just this is probably where the learning really occurs. The second theme involved the importance of interaction and conversation. We all learn best in interactions and conversations with other people about what we're learning. And you know, while this is true for each of us, it's really especially true for preschoolers. They learn best when they not only hear what is being taught, but talk about what they're learning with their teachers and peers. Ideally, this involves conversations with the teacher and, in, and the individual child that involves at least three terms. For example, where the teacher talks, the child talks, and the teacher talks. And this can happen in whole group instruction, but it probably works best in small group centers or in individual interactions between the teacher and the child. The third theme that emerged involved the importance of lessons building sequentially. New learning should proceed in a deliberate systematic order from easy to more difficult. In the fall, it's important to figure out what is the skill level of the children what, and to start at that level as you introduce new, new lessons. To introduce new skills in those lessons, it's important to show how they build up the skills children already have. And it's, again, really important to provide lots of practice, not only of the, the, of the skills and concepts that you're teaching at this time, but also of the already learned skills and concepts so that they can maintain those. Next slide, please. Um, the fourth theme involved the importance of scheduling time for intentional learning. It's important to schedule, to have a schedule that includes in, in, intentional um, instruction time devoted to social emotional learning, executive functioning, mathematics, literacy, and language. So while it, it's very important to ensure that you provide instruction specific to each content area, but while if possible, using instruction in one content area to reinforce or repeat lessons in another. So for example, if you're reading a book in which a child gets frustrated, perhaps you can ask what the child could do to calm down, hoping that children will respond with some of the lessons that they learned from um, social emotional instruction earlier. The final theme involves the importance of recognizing everyone's background and experiences. Preschool should reflect and value the cultural, racial, and linguistic backgrounds of children, teachers, and communities. The classroom should include artwork, books, activities, conversations that reflect who the children are and celebrate their next and celebrate their background. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm going to present uh, recommendation one, which is to regularly provide intentional, engaging instruction and practice focused on social emotional skills. Next slide, please. There are five how to steps. I'm going to go through them as an overview, and then we're going to go through each one with a little bit more information. So the first one is to follow a curriculum that promotes incremental social emotional learning. Second step, have teachers intentionally devote time every day to teach social emotional skills in an engaging way. Step three, plan staged activities for children to practice social emotional skills where there's a scaffold real support for them as they learn to use the skill. Step four, then take advantage of naturally occurring situations to reinforce and help children generalize those skills for everyday use. And then finally, step five, inform parents, caregivers, and guardians about the social emotional skills children are learning at school so they can be practiced and reinforced at home. Next slide, please. So what do we mean when we talk about social emotional skills? This is really a set of schools that set children up for success at school and in later life. They include emotion-focused skills, so being able to identify and understand their own feelings, being able to understand what kinds of situations are associated with feelings, how they feel on the inside, what they look like on the outside. Also being able to accurately read other people's emotions, being able to manage strong emotions, calm down when you feel upset and put your feelings um, into words so that you can problem solve effectively and control your behavior so you're able to make good choices. 
feel empathy for other children's feelings and also the capacity to establish and sustain positive relationships with peers and with adults in their lives. Next slide, please. So the first how-to step is the recommendation that teachers follow a curriculum, an evidence-based curriculum that promotes incremental social emotional learning. Uh, sometimes teachers feel like they can uh, support social emotional learning just in the context of the everyday classroom. And although that's uh, an excellent thing to do, it's hard for children to learn unless they have skills presented in a real scope and sequence. And so evidence-based uh, curricula really provide teachers with lesson plans that give them that systematic scaffold to work on which they can then innovate around. It's important for teachers to look at the different programs that are available so they're able to use one that's appropriate for the ages and developmental needs of children in their classroom. And it's often important to, to in both the choice of a program and also in the way they use and innovate around the program to consider the cultural differences in way children learn to express and regulate their feelings. There are several sources available uh, for teachers and administrators to look at to choose a good program. These are um, clearing houses that include information about the research backing the program and also descriptions of what the program involves. They're collaborative for academic social emotional learning website, blueprints for healthy youth development, and the What Works Clearing House. Next slide, please. So, how to step two? We recommend that teachers. I set aside time every day to intentionally teach social emotional skills in an engaging way. Most of these evidence-based curricula provide lesson plans that are designed to be taught once or twice a week in about a 10 or 20 minute lesson. These standard and, and uh, structured lessons give teachers a time to introduce the skill in a brief engaging way that, to give children an idea of what the skill is and to build the vocabulary and understanding of how to use the skill. Usually these lessons involve telling stories, little puppet shows, brief role plays, discussions of the children's own experience that bring that skill to life. Next slide, please. The curricula also include ideas for planned stage activities. So these are activities that are designed to really scaffold and support children's practice of the skill when they are just learning. it. So for example, on this slide, there's a picture of a turtle uh, technique. Um, almost every one of these evidence-based social emotional curriculum have some version of a turtle. And it's basically teaching children a set of routines to use when they're feeling very excited or very um, uh, upset to help them stop their behavior, go into their shell, calm down, take a, take a breath, maybe count down to feel calmer. And then when they are ready to uh, talk about their feelings, put their feelings into words and explain the problem. So they're set up for problem solving. It helps for children to practice this set of routines when they're calm so that they've overlearned the routine. They're better able to access it and use it when they're upset. Uh, next step, please. Staged activities can also be used to practice other kinds of skills. This particular slide uh, shows um, things that you might do to practice how a child can ask for help appropriately. Um, another uh, kind of staged activity that many teachers will do at this time of the year when children are new is um, going through role plays of how you can invite a friend to play with you or how you can uh, make an overture to join another child's play basically the initial steps for uh, making friends. These staged activities have different content, but they tend to follow the same set of steps. That first, there's a role play, a chance to sort of lay out the, the standard routine for whatever you're working on, asking for help, making a friend, using turtle. Um, then role play an example of how that looks, set up opportunities for children themselves to um, uh, practice for help. And then the teacher summarizes the lessons take away uh, the key points of skill, um, skill use. The next slide goes on to talk about and how to generalize those in a natural way throughout the day. 
Good afternoon. I'm Kimberly Nelson, Executive Director of Early Childhood for the Rockford Public Schools, and we're going to take a look at how to step four. In this step, we focus on taking advantage of naturally occurring situations to reinforce and review social emotional skills. The preschool daily routine offers many opportunities for children to review and practice the social emotional skills they've been learning. While it is best practice to frequently review target skills with all children, it is essential that teachers intentionally and consistently review, practice, and reinforce the target skills at the beginning of the year and as new children join the classroom community. Focusing on times that children may be emotional or interacting with others, such as snack time, waiting to use the bathroom, free play, provides an opportunity for teachers to intentionally embed, review, and practice these skills. It is critical that all adults supporting children in the classroom are aware of the expectations and target skills to ensure that children are getting consistent support from the adults. Next slide. Let's take a look at a sample plan for using activities for, from the curriculum for each day. In this example, a teacher has intentionally planned to introduce the concept of deep breathing to calm down when they feel upset. She's intentionally used her curriculum throughout the week and planned a series of activities that provide the children with opportunities to learn about a feeling, share about times they've experienced that feeling, and practice the target skill. In addition, the teacher can intentionally embed other opportunities throughout the week for children to practice and be reinforced for using the target skill. Next slide. How to step five, inform parents, caregivers, and guardians about the socio-emotional skills children are learning so skills can be practiced and reinforced at home. Parents, caregivers, and guardians are key partners in supporting the development of socio-emotional skills. Regularly sharing information with parents, caregivers, and guardians can naturally provide children with additional opportunities to practice the targeted skills and transfer the skills outside of the classroom environment. Teachers can use a variety of ways to communicate the information, such as a brief note, an email, a phone call, or even a video demonstrating or explaining the target skills. Next slide. We recommend including the specific language or vocabulary that corresponds to the social emotional skills. For example, if the target skill is taking turns, the teacher could highlight the language to use while playing a simple board game by saying, it's my turn now, you have to wait, and it's your turn now, I have to wait. When possible, this information should be shared with families in their primary language. Next slide. Let's take a look at a sample note to identify how the teacher intentionally shares with the family. In this note, the teacher shares specific information about what the child are learning. They are learning about feelings. The teacher also shares the target skill that children are expected to do. In this example, the target skill is to name their feelings. The teacher then enlists the family's help and names the four basic feelings they are learning about. Next, the teacher gives the families the specific language to use. I am feeling because. Giving families the specific language will reinforce that children feel the emotion instead of being the emotion. For example, I am feeling sad versus I am sad. In addition to a brief note, teachers may want to share simple, easy to follow activities that parents, caregivers, and guardians can do with their children to review and reinforce the social emotional skills, such as taking deep breaths, counting to wait, playing games, or reading a book. Next slide. Here are some additional activities to suggest in take home letters. Sharing activities that can be easily incorporated into a family's daily routine do not require much money or prep preparation, and do not take too much time to carry out will increase the likelihood of families reinforcing the targeted skill and naturally embedding it into their daily action interactions with their children. Next slide. 
Throughout this guide, we share recommended practices, how-to steps that provide guidance on implementation, and a few obstacles with suggestions for ad addressing potential challenges to implementation. While the panel identified a few potential ob obstacles for each recommendation, please note that staff may not have any obstacles related to the re recommendation, or they may have others. At times, it may be necessary to engage other teachers or team members to identify additional approaches to teach the targeted skills. For example, a teacher may need to provide visuals to support the child, a child or children in their room. Next slide. When supporting professional learning around these recommendations, it is important for administrators to be aware of these potential barriers as they develop their plan to intentionally support staff. As administrators, we need to intentionally share the expectations, provide opportunities for staff to practice, and reinforce their implementation through positive descriptive feedback when staff are implementing these strategies. Supporting staff is really a parallel process to supporting children. Next slide. Good afternoon. My name is Megan McClellan from Oregon State University, and I'm here to talk about recommendation two, which focuses on how to strengthen children's executive function skills using specific games and activities. In this recommendation, I'll talk about how to use, next slide, sorry. In this recommendation, I'll talk about how to use intentionally designed games to build children's executive function skills how to challenge children by increasing the complexity of the games and activities over time, and how to embed executive function activities in literacy, math, art, or other parts of the day. Next slide. It might be helpful to quickly discuss how executive function is related to social emotional skills. And as we all know, they clearly overlap. So as you can see here, executive function includes skills that are related to being able to pay attention and focus for a child, memory, such as remembering and following directions, and something we call cognitive flexibility, which is being able to switch from one thing to the next, switch attention, and also think flexibly. In contrast, social emotional skills include slightly different things like sharing, cooperating, developing positive relationships with others, identifying emotions like we just heard about, and problem solving in social situations. So executive function skills are different from social emotional skills, but they're also clearly related and they overlap, especially in the areas of self-control and self-regulation. Next slide. So now let's talk about how we can use intentionally designed games to build children's executive function skills. You can help children practice executive function by using games that ask children to do three things, to have them stop, think first, and then do something. So using games that have multiple steps or instructions will help children listen to, remember, and follow directions. Games that require children to connect their actions to visual, oral, or musical cues can help children think quickly and flexibly and switch from one thing to the next. And games that ask children to respond to the teacher's directions one at a time can help children learn to wait for their turn. Depending on a child's age, it's useful to play executive function games for about 10 to 20 minutes to similar to recommendations for social emotional skills. Um, obviously we want this to be shorter for younger children and longer for older children. And this also, as we know, depends on a child's developmental stage. And to also use a consistent and predictable routine to carry out a game. So we use a routine that includes like a greeting song, a game, and then a closing song. And we keep to that routine. Next slide. So here are a few examples of games that help children practice following directions, thinking flexibly or switching and controlling their behavior. You can read more about these games in the practice guide, but I'll just give a few examples. 
One is one that we use called red light, purple light, where the teacher tells children to do a certain action when a color or shape is presented. For example, a teacher can stand at one end of the room and hold up different colors of paper circles. Children have to walk, not run, walk closer when a red circle is shown and stop when a purple circle is shown. And as I'll talk about in the next slide, you can also change out the rules to make it more complex. Another variation is, is um, another game is a variation of the freeze game where a, a teacher plays music and children dance when the music is on and then freeze when the music stops. You can then ask children to dance slowly to slower songs and more quickly dance fast to fast songs. And then you can change the rules and have children dance slowly to fast music and fast to slow music. Next slide. So now let me talk about how you can continue to challenge children's executive function skills by increasing the complexity of games and activities over time. So once children become comfortable and have mastered rules in a game, it's an important way to continue to practice these skills. Um, so you can make games more challenging by doing a number of things. And you can adapt these to what works for you um, in your situation. You can add more rules to the game. You can give less guidance about how to play a game. So you can put up the instructions and then take them away and ask children to remember what the instructions are. You can increase the speed in which the game is played. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can change the rules for a game. So you can switch out rules that um, and have them switch from one rule to the next. Um, you can, if there's roles that are played, you can change the roles that children play in a game. That's also a great um, strategy. And you can encourage children to notice and talk about what is making the game more difficult. So having children reflect on what makes games hard can really help practice and internalize these executive function skills so that they can then generalize those skills to other um, activities. Next slide. Games, such as Simon says, provide children with opportunities to go from being a follower to becoming a leader. Once children know the rules of the game and have been successful in participating in the game as a follower, give them opportunities to lead. Teachers will intentionally review the role of the leader and then become a participant with other children during the game. Teachers may want to select older children to lead first, giving younger children the opportunity to observe and learn from their peers before they have a chance to become the leader. Next slide. How to step three. Let's take a look at how we can embed executive function activities in literacy, math, art, or other parts of the day. At the beginning of the year, teachers should intentionally teach model and practice skills that will be embedded throughout the daily routine that support flexible thinking, problem solving, and self-control. Through intentional planning, teachers can embed these skills naturally throughout the day, giving children opportunities to practice the skills in a supportive environment. For example, during circle time, teachers can model think time before raising their hand to answering a question or sharing. Children can then practice the skill as a group or with a peer, providing positive descriptive feedback to children such as, thank you, Kim, for raising your hand when you wanted to share, will acknowledge the child, thus reinforcing the likelihood of the skill being repeated by both that child and others. Next slide. Here are some examples of embedding executive function activities during literacy, mathematics, arts, and crafts. When planning, it's important that teachers identify the specific skill to practice, when to practice the skill, and how to practice to ensure the intentionality and connection to the curriculum. Teachers can introduce the skill and to be practiced in circle time and then embed the skill later in the day to reinforce the skill. For example, during circle time, a teacher could plan an action song, such as going on a bear hunt, that includes a sequence of actions that children remember. 
During literacy instruction, the teacher reads a book such as The Hungry Caterpillar and prompts the children to remember what the caterpillar ate. Next slide. Executive function skills are distinct and need to be taught intentionally. Teachers of young children should not assume that children have developed these skills prior to entering school. Introducing these skills during circle time or small group time provides an opportunity for children to learn, while at the same time embedding the opportunities to practice these skills throughout the daily routine reinforces the skill. We need to allow children time to practice these skills in a supportive environment before we add to their complexity. Next slide. Thank you, Peg, Karen, Kim, and Megan. We will now move on to the question and answer portion. Thank you to all our attendees for submitting your questions in the Q&A box. I invite the presenters to turn on their video screens for this Q&A portion. Thank you. Our first question is for Megan. How can I incorporate practice and executive function without adding more tasks in my day? Megan? Sure. Um, so I think that one of the, the things that people have emphasized is how you can um, embed some of these skills, these all co-developed in young children. And so how can we embed some of the skills that we've talked about into the activities you're already doing? And I think that one of the important things to take away was the overall themes that Peg was talking about in the beginning, which is just the importance of intentionality when you're teaching in general. Good teachers, we know, do lots of these things already. And being intentional about you know, adding in some new rules, doing some things that can increase complexity. It's not about adding, um, I remember, um, there was a school in another country and they, they wanted to have a separate class that was like a social emotional class rather than um, trying to talk about how we could embed some of these things into activities and the content that they're already giving children because that has the greatest opportunity in my opinion to generalize. Karen, um, did you want to also add anything or any of the other panelists? I mean, the only thing I would add is um, a lot of times transition periods can also be useful for setting up the, these kinds of, of self-control games or games where there's a routine and then the routine or pattern changes. Um, it can help you sort of have a smooth transition, a kind of a fun challenge in the transition, as well as in, embed that kind of game practice. Yeah, and, and Karen, I was thinking the same thing. Um, one of the things that when I'm supporting a teacher, many times they're talking about transition time and or wait time as times where challenges occur. And many times that is through through not really intentionally planning those things. So not only that transition time, like that drumbeat activity um, that was shared is a great way, especially when moving from gross motor time. Um, back into line and transitioning back. It's a great way to get the kids' attention. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, use um, use those leaders that we just talked about giving children an opportunity to lead. You're having wait time, say, at the bathroom. Do that which way brain builder, and that's a great way to use a child as a leader that allows the teacher then to kind of help gather children as they go. Thank you all. I'll move on to our next question. This one is for Karen. How can I make social emotional learning engaging and interesting? Karen? Um, I actually think preschool children are really interested in feelings and they're really interested in making friends and figuring out how to get along. Um, the key is really to embed it in, in an engaging story, a puppet show, uh, a, a role play. Um, we often do uh, do it as a sort of what went wrong. Like the teacher talks about a story or illustrates a way of making a friend that didn't work and asks the children, you know, can you tell me what I did wrong? 
Preschoolers love that. <laughs> they love to identify, um, you know, what went wrong and, and give their suggestions. So I think making sure that you're presenting it in a way that gives children a chance to, to react and contribute and respond. Um, but the, the topic itself is, is usually very exciting and interesting to them when you can present it again in an interactive way. Thank you, Karen. I'll move on to our next question. Um, this one is for Kim. What can we do to support and train teachers when there are educators or administrators who still believe that a quiet classroom is a well-managed classroom? Kim? Oh, that's a good one. So I think as administrators, um, maybe what we need to do is make sure that administrators understand that a uh, um, quiet early childhood classroom really is probably a concern. Um, obviously, we don't want it completely out of control and yelling, but children learn through interactions and it's very difficult to interact um, if children are not talking and problem solving and doing the natural work of young children, which is playing. And when children play, um, opportunities are going to come up for us to practice these social emotional skills. You know, they're moving from young children who the whole world has revolved around them to becoming part of a classroom community. And so these opportunities are going to be there. And I think just us remembering that sometimes our role is to make sure that others understand the work of early childhood and what that looks like. Um, and actually, you know, remembering how how long early childhood goes up and through schools, um, you really don't want those quiet, quiet classrooms. I am actually more concerned if I walk in to a room where classrooms are very quiet. Um, so just having natural opportunities for children to communicate, to learn to communicate, um, to learn how to express what they're feeling, obviously appropriately, there's going to be young children that um, have very strong emotions and they need to um, have opportunities, like we said, when they're calm to practice that, to practice the breathing. Um, what a great gift we can give to children as they move up through um, you know, upper grades if they can really learn to self-regulate. So um, having classrooms that are active and engaging um, is really a good sign. Thanks, Kim. I'll move on to our next question. This one is for Megan. Self-control and self-regulation self seems like it was presented as between executive function and social emotional skills. Could you please expand on that idea? Megan? Sure. Um, I'll take a, that's a good question. You know, there's lots of debate and I think it can be really confusing for, for all of us, honestly, in the field, because we, lots of people have different views of how to define these skills. But I think what's helpful is um, in some of the ways we've been thinking about it and, and others also that, you know, you have executive function of cognitive processes that then sort of help you um, self-regulate more generally. And so we talk about it um, as sort of the, how do you manifest those cognitive processes into behavior? And it's, it clearly overlaps, you know, under um, between with social emotional skills because you there are two sides of the same coin. You have to be able to use those cognitive processes then to also control your emotions and your feelings. And so I think that it pulls from both sides when you're talking about self-control and self-regulation. Um, it to us, it's sort of the how do you translate those skills those cognitive processes into skills? And then also how do you bring in the social emotional side together? Those things allow children to self-regulate um, and also control their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Karen probably has also a really good way to answer this question. I would just add to what you're saying, Megan. I think, you know, sort of balancing. So when we talk about executive function, we really are talking about some processes that are going on in that in that frontal part of the developing brain that have to do with being able to um, control your attention, being able to be flexible in your thinking. Um, but parallel to that is the behavioral regulation skills, the actual knowledge about how do you uh, repair a, a problem that's emerged? How do you solve a conflict that's occurred? And those are really 
um, skills that, that don't just happen because you're good at managing and, and um, modulating your attention. They also really require knowledge about relationships, the capacity to read the other person's um, feelings and to express your own feelings. And so self-regulation really does have both sides. It has that cognitive piece that um, we're talking about with the executive function. And it also has these these really important behavioral or social skills associated with them. And so it's one of those areas of functioning that I think we're working on with both types of programming. Um, the executive function skills have a little bit more to do also with building co cognitive skills, mathematics and, and reading readiness. And so we will see that different kinds of cognitive activities also contribute to EF, whereas the behavioral regulation, that has to do also with being able to um, inhibit your aggressiveness and being able to find more um, social and empathic ways of interacting with others. So the, if you think sort of like a Venn diagram, there's areas where there's an overlap and also areas that are more effectively being moved with an executive function focus and those that are being moved through your social emotional stories and um, behavioral practice. Thank you, it's a great conversation. I'll move on to our next question. This one is for Peg. How do we manage mixed age classrooms, Peg? That is a great question, especially given that we're seeing more and more mixed age classrooms with the idea that this is a more family-like way of grouping children. And it also gives programs probably a little more flexibility in meeting regulations regarding, you know, um, so I, and I think it presents many challenges. And I, I think a lot of this has to do with being planful and deliberate in planning for activities that everybody can do. And then having activities that may be more appropriate for the older children and the younger children, but it also, allows for the opportunity of the older children to be peer teachers with the younger children when appropriate. So I think that if as a if the teacher can figure out where this may be appropriate and pair children up like that, you can see some wonderful things. And I would love to see, you no, know, I would love for other people to um, add their opinions as well. You know, I was thinking about um the games when that question was asked. And so um, playing games and adding complexity to games. And when I think of younger children in a classroom, it may be that you introduce the game in a small group activity. So all children have an opportunity to do that. But during their center time or free play time, that's a great time for um, an adult um, to engage in that game with maybe just one child. So if you've got that younger child and they're not really sure and they're having a hard time playing a game, that's a great place for the adult who does know how to share and take turns um, to model and to give the younger child opportunities to practice. And then as the child gets more skilled, inviting another child maybe of similar age to come and play as a group of three before then you know, bringing that back to the larger group. I just think it's all about being intentional and looking for those natural places to provide some additional practice for the young children. Um, and you know that free play or center time is a great time because children are moving about the room and um, they love engaging with an adult during that time. So I think, you know, thinking about where to embed some of those extra practices is a great idea, but um, that was the one thing I was thinking about. I, I would add that most of the um, social emotional curriculum where they have these lesson plans, they are set out with a developmental progression. And so depending on what percentage of kids in your classroom, if you have if you have more threes, you may move through that more slowly in the large group and use small group or individual activities to cover some of the later more complex um, social emotional skills. If you have more fours, you may move forward and let the threes be exposed to those ideas, but work in small group with more of the threes around practicing the basic skills. Definitely a balance that, you know, it's where a, a teacher's ability to 
take that evidence base, but then also adapt the pacing and the and the grouping so it fits the mastery learning of the children she has. That's just so important. Okay, thank you. Our next question I will pose for Kim. What do I do if some kids are able to follow the rules and others refuse to follow the rules of a game? Kim? So I think I was, you know, mentioning that a little bit um, just in the last question is making sure that um, we have an opportunity to provide some additional time to practice if needed. I've often found too, sometimes visuals. Um, so say you're in the middle of the game and the visuals are out there with the rules. Um, if someone is not you know, um, following the game, it could be as easy as pointing to the visual for the rule that the child's not following, right? So I think just being intentional there. And if a young child is really um, not gonna participate right there, I guess it depends on when you're doing the activity. Sometimes having an alternative activity set up so the child could maybe go engage in something else so you don't lose the whole group, right? I think that's the question that comes up frequently. I'm trying to do this as a whole group activity and I have the one that is not. Maybe give them a fidget or give them something else because even if they're sitting away, they're still listening, they're still learning, um, even if they're sitting with a fidget and not wanting to play right then, but then going back and spending some time maybe individually or again in another small group to give the child the opportunity. That's always a balance. You know, um, if you've got a group of children and you have one, if it's not too disruptive to have the young child, um, you know, have that fidget or have something else and sitting away um, or engaging in, in a book or something else like that while you can keep it going so that you don't lose the whole classroom. Again, it would be something to plan. I would imagine that as a teacher, you know that one or two, one or two little ones that may not want to comply right then. Maybe they've had a hard day that day, or maybe this has been something that you've been working on with them. Again, it's about that intentional planning. What are you going to do if? So just have that available, but visuals will sometimes work as a quick little cue to get the child back or give them another, you know, another um, job within the game, or again, have that alternative activity planned, but then go back and reteach or provide that practice opportunity at a later date. I would just add one thing, which is sometimes it can also be helpful to have if if there's another adult in the classroom or um, to pair a child who's, you know, having some challenges. Um, you can have a little bit of, I think Kim already alluded to this, but having someone work alongside that child uh, to scaffold sort of the behavior in, in if you're doing these kinds of games. Another thing is to partner children with each other. Um, one, you know, so that they can work together um, and help each other or one who's a little bit uh, has an easier time with the games can help another child or a friend. So, um, so, so that's another way we can try to um, bring in, be inclusive and, and also um, help children practice these skills. Okay, thank you. Our next question I will pose to Megan. Can you explain again the differences between I am feeling sad and I am sad? Megan? Sure, I think that's more of a, a Karen Kim question, but um, I <laughs> and I think it's from my postdoc, my <laughs> Chinghua. <laughs> um, I think it's you know identifying the feeling rather that this is how you're feeling rather than this is how I am as a person. But you, Karen can correct me. No, that's exactly right. You you want them to understand that you know feelings can change. Um, that programs often start out naming feelings but later move on to things like there's how you feel on the inside and then how you behave you you can't always help how you feel inside but you can choose how to behave so when you create a language that positions that feeling as something that is more temporary that they are feeling at the moment it can change it can be different from a behavior um it helps set your your um the child up for then moving on to that that more important or extended understanding of what a feeling is. Sometimes when children, um, particularly young children, when you say I'm mad, they they just have this feeling of just a whole lack of control of their 
um, being. Um, and, and you want to help them move away from that. So it's a subtle language difference, but that way, that's what you're trying to set up for. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna pose this question to the group, uh, so feel free to chime in here. The children in my classroom don't speak English fluently. How can I adapt the games to ensure they understand how to play them? Sorry, was that to me? <laughs> that one's for the group. So feel oh, the group. free to take that one. <laughs> um, does someone else want to start first? Well, I, we have a lot of English language learners in our program, and we do do uh, use a lot of visuals. Um, and it could be that you may even want to engage in conversation with the parents, you know, just to make sure that it, in case there's any other cultural um, thing that they may need to know about, about the games. But we have found that um, using visuals that, you know, show the pictures of the rules and the games and things like that is helpful. Um, but, you know, when possible, invite parents actually to come in, um, you know, and that's a great opportunity for the parents to engage in the classroom. And, and if, if they speak English and you can use them to help translate too, just to get the game going, I mean, that's a that's an opportunity. But, you know, English language learners, um, I would say work with if you have opportunities to connect with your bilingual department on other specific strategies. But you know, good early childhood practice always includes visuals. And I think that is what that's one way I know that our teachers do work with that. But then, you know, connecting with the child's family as well, um, just to learn a little bit more. Um, maybe it's something the way they say it and things like that can help support. Um, but I'll pass it over to anyone else. Well, the only thing I would add is some of the uh, published um, social emotional curricula do have translated versions, Spanish versions. It, it doesn't really completely solve the problem. It gives, it gives you posters and other kind of visuals to use that are, um, you know, in the language. But I still think you need to check, especially we always say with local teachers or parents is a great idea about more, you know, colloquial um, use of language that might be, might fit that particular um, culture. The only thing I would add is a lot of, of classrooms, especially Head Start classrooms, may in, include assistant teachers who may speak the child's home language and just making sure that you're incorporating them in the activities when, when you're including the children for whom English is an, a, a first language may be really helpful. And one final thing I will say is, you know, really being... Um, you know, taking some time to use home language, encouraging home language use, trying to talk to families about what um, language and um, words are important in their own language and figuring out how to embed that in the classroom, I think can really strengthen that parent, um, the parent teacher and the homeschool connection in really important and culturally sensitive ways. Um, the only other thing I would say is, in addition is to model um, and use gestures. And then um, so trying to incorporate that child's cultural background into what you're doing, modeling and using gestures. I think it just goes a long way to be um, inclusive of, of these families and the backgrounds and how we can, that's going to help um, engage um, parents and yeah. children. You know, one thing I was thinking when Megan said that about in including the parents, and I mentioned that is ask the parents, what kind of games do you play at home? And what a great idea to allow the child or the family to come in and teach one of their games um, in the classroom. It's another great way to be inclusive. And then you get the idea of the turn taking and things like that with something that might be familiar. A lot of these you can adapt to fit, you know, a cultural context or um, other things. You, I mean, the idea here is, you know, how to be more intentional maybe than or continue to be intentional in how you're teaching and using these games and adapt them, adapt them as you need to, um, to be inclusive, to be responsive, to really engage um, children, I would say. Okay, thank you all. We're getting some great questions here. 
I'll move on to the next one. I'll pose this for Kim. How can we teach social emotional learning and executive function skills in a way that would help children that are very emotional when dropping off in the mornings for school? Oh, great. That never happens, especially at the beginning of the year, right? Um, you know, again, if, it, if we're about being intentional, so you know, we have children starting at the very beginning of the year. I would do a meet and greet with parents um, prior to um, starting school if you have the opportunity to have them come in and see the room and things like that. And again, you know, you might want to use, um, you know, some great social stories out there about like what happens when I come to school. I I come in, I give my mommy a kiss um, or whoever. I wave goodbye. I am safe. You know, there's all sorts of um, ways you could do that. But again, engaging with the families prior to talk with the families about what does drop off routine mean? Because a lot of times that um, separation time is about the parent as much as it is about the child. And so giving the families the expectation of what you want to see, you know, um, you know, will you know, even if it's like, you know, if your child's going to cry for X long, we will be sure to contact you or we'll let you know how, um, how long it took for them to calm down. Um, asking questions prior to the child starting. What, what's the child's maybe favorite book or does he have a favorite, um, you know, stuffed toy or something that could be put in the backpack if you know that transitioning is going to be a problem. So really intentionally consider what your day, what that routine is. What does the drop-off routine look like? What does it need to be? Consistently teach it not only to the child but to the family, so that everybody knows what's that going, what that's going to be. Even using specific language that will help support both um, child and family, and then just being consistent about doing um, that thing, whatever that routine is. Um, and in some classrooms, I've seen teachers even just hang something up by where they um, hang up their backpack. That you know give mom a hug, hang coat up, blah, blah, blah. Just have that very structured thing right there and just keep reminding them and keep practicing it. But that beginning of the year routine is so important and I can't emphasize enough connecting with that family prior to the child starting to talk that through or maybe getting them into the classroom to see what it's like so it's not this strange place to go. And I'd be open to any other ideas from the panel on that one. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. We are unable to answer all of the questions that we're receiving given the time constraints for this webinar, but on the next slide, I will explain where additional questions can be submitted. I want to thank our panelists, Peg, Karen, Kim, and Megan for their presentations on recommendations one and two and their insightful responses to questions. This was the first of three webinars for this practice guide on preparing young children for school. This the second webinar is tomorrow, Wednesday at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and we'll focus on the third and fourth practice, practice guide recommendations on mathematical ideas and mathematical language. The third webinar is on Thursday of this week at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and we'll focus on recommendations five, six, and seven on vocabulary, letters and sounds, and shared book reading. This presentation contains just a few examples from the practice guide. The full practice guide and additional materials can be accessed on the What Works Clearinghouse website. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, this webinar was recorded. A link to view the recorded webinar will be shared via email to all attendees who registered for this webinar. The recording will also be available on the IES website. If you have additional questions, and I see that we do have a couple more in chat there. So if you have more questions, please submit them via email to the WWC Help Desk at contact.wwc.ed.gov. Thank you. This concludes our webinar.